let me be brief and um, announce Alex Gunning from Oxford University he will be speaking about the efficiency of Feynman's quantum computer. It's an exciting topic. So thanks for coming, at least virtually. And yeah. the stage is all yours. Perfect. Um, yeah, so as Jens just kindly introduced, um, my name's Alex, and I'm currently doing the master's in Oxford in mathematical and theoretical physics. Um, I'm currently working with Andrew Daly in a project on fast scrambling and long-range interactions, but we only really started that last week, so there was no point in me talking about that today. So I'm going to instead talk about some work I did during my undergrad. Um, I did a summer internship with the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, my internship was actually extended for my entire final year of my undergrad. Um, so I was working on that for basically a year, and we looked into uh, the efficiency of Feynman's quantum computer. I worked with this with my colleague, Ralph Costales, under um, Tony Dorless. Um, okay, so let's get started. So there's going to be a lot of different concepts that I'm going to introduce throughout this, the most important of which will be Feynman's clock space, uh, which was Feynman's construction for implementing a unitary computation by evolving with a static Hamiltonian that I'll mention in much greater detail uh, to come. Feynman's original study was basically a study of principle. He wanted to exhibit that um, you could kind of use a Hamiltonian to a Hamiltonian of a system that, that could serve as a computer. He did not look at all into if it was an efficient model or how best to implement it. Um, so I guess in our study, we really wanted to address one of these questions as the core aim um, of our research. And that was to look into just how efficient the model was. We are dealing with, still with an ideal machine and we're not quite looking into how best this could be implemented. Can I, can I make a, a general comment? Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to distract your flow, but um, it's actually interesting because, I mean, indeed Feynman didn't really point that out in his paper, but I mean, the the um, paper in which Feynman introduced quantum computing and quantum simulation is actually pretty uh, detailed on notions of efficiency in general terms. I mean, that's much cited and never really read this paper. One should yeah. read because there's a lot of meat in it and like notions of mutual simulatability and efficiency, it's all there. And, and he had it much on the radar, like that this yeah. is really what matters. Well, it's a general comment, but yeah, uh, it's a really good read. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, for the efficient, I'll get into what we mean with efficiency in our particular study. It basically relates to the runtime of the model and how long a computation would actually take. Um, but I think what a really good thing to do in our study was to compare it with a model that is a bit more heavily researched, which is kind of the adiabatic model of quantum computation. The reason we chose this is it's actually researched in great detail with regards to the evolution using Feynman's clock space. So I'll get into some of the work that was done well with regards to that. And then we can kind of really compare the two models and see which would be, in theory, um, a more uh, efficient model to use. And then we'll get into a bit of the results um, and a discussion at the end into some of the other things and an outlook of what we could look into. Uh, so to begin with this talk, um, for Feynman's quantum computer, um, we view quantum computation in terms of the circuit model in which a calculation is implemented in several stages. So we'll basically start by preparing a, uh, a set of n-logical qubits uh, in the computational basis state psi in. I'll often refer to this as the register, and the register will contain the qubits that we actually want to compute on. We're then going to act on the state with a suitably chosen unitary operator u, and we'll obtain a final state psi out of our calculation. Now, in a similar way of how uh, the operations of AND, NOT, and OR gates uh, are sufficient to implement any um, unitary operation or logical operation, it was actually shown that um, you can approximate this matrix u um, by a sequence of k operations, uh, where these are chosen from a set of basic unitary matrices, and they're each going to act on some subset of the n qubits in our register, and we'll still be able to arrive at that output state um, psi out. An interesting thing Feynman did was he was able to show that you could achieve quantum computation by actually um, mapping from our circuit model to a continuous time evolution uh, using a time-independent Hamiltonian while still implementing that discrete sequence of unitaries. And the way he did that was he actually exploited the fact that um, we, can, we can represent these K operations using a matrix G, which is gonna be the two to the K plus one by two to the K plus one matrix that would achieve the same goal, the same output um, of the K operations. 
Now we have to think about how we could actually generate this G in a physical way, knowing those similar elements. And it's not immediately obvious how we could do that. But if we remember in quantum mechanics, we can always make use of the time evolution equation as given here. So we all now psi out at a given time t is represented in this form here. Our psi in is that um, the input state for a system with Hamiltonian H. Now we now have to think about, and it's actually kind of difficult, um, to how we could actually, for a special time t, uh, find a Hamiltonian that would be able to generate this G when it is such a product of non-commuting matrices. But we again will make a useful um, a use of this useful trick, which is that we can tailor expand our evolution operator at any time into the sequence of instead of just the exponential acting on the input state, we'll have the Hamiltonian instead acting on it and a numerous amount of time. So twice, thrice and so forth that will lead to our output state. So this is basically all the background we need to now get into. Um, sorry, there we go. Then we can now get into Feynman's construction to basically uh, implement this unitary operation by evolving with a static Hamiltonian. And his invention for this was the clock space. So what this basically was is Feynman decided to add to the, K, to the n qubits in our register, a whole new set of k plus one qubits, which we'll call program counter sites. And these are gonna live in an ancillary clock space. Now the purpose of this clock space and this program counter is to basically track the progress of our computation. And I wanna illustrate how this will work. So what we'll basically do is at the start of our computation, we'll prepare, or we'll prepare our clock space to be in the state zero. So the zero state of the clock space is how we'll initialize this calculation. Now, a good way of visualizing this is imagining each state of the clock space as being an electron kind of hopping or tunneling from one orbital to the next. So when a site is occupied by an electron, we'll use the one state. And when it's unoccupied, we'll use the zero state. And how this will be used to track the progress of the computation is as we evolve in our calculation, we'll move from one the first state of the clock space to the next ones. And as this happens, we'll act on the register with the corresponding unitary operation. So for example, we'll start in the zero state and in moving from the zero state to the ones, the first state, the electron will hop from the zero side to the first side. And as this happens, we'll act with a U1 operator on some subset of the uh, uh, qubits in our register. And going from the first state to the second state, we'll act with U2 and all, and we'll go the whole way along until finally we're going from the K minus one, one state to the K state, in which finally we're gonna tunnel that electron from the K minus one site to the K site. And we're acting with our final operator UK on the register. Now, what we claim here, or what I want you to observe is that in going from the zero state to the K state, we've acted all operators on our register. So that means we can now, instead of measure, measuring the register itself, we can measure the clock space. And if we find at any later time that we are in the Kate state of the clock space, we know that matrix G is acted on our register and we have the output of our computation. So for the remainder of this project, we basically, our playground is gonna be this Hilbert space, which contains both a clock register or a program counter, which is gonna contain K plus one states that will label the progress of our computation as well as a data register, which is gonna hold the actual qubits that we want to compute on. So how this is work, will work is we're gonna evolve some initial state that we're gonna call psi naught, which is this combination of being in the zero state of the clock space and having that input state of our register. We'll evolve it with Feynman's Hamiltonian that I'm yet to define and arrive. we'll hope to arrive at some resulting state that lives in this space here, which is basically a combination of these psi t's where psi t represents being in the teeth state of the clock space with t operators acting on psi n. Now I'm sure you'll notice if t equals k here, we're gonna be in that final state of the clock space, meaning all k operators will have acted on psi n, meaning this actually refers to psi out of our register and we have the answer of our computation. Now, what is Feynman's Hamiltonian that actually allows us to um, do a computation in this way? So I've defined it here um, in two different ways in three and four into different notations. The first thing I want you to note from um, Feynman's Hamiltonian is that these QI and QI daggers are simply just the annihilation and creation operators acting on the ith side of the program counter. Now this, these creation annihilation operators do not at all act on the register themselves. However, the U operators do, these U operators will act on um, our register, the actual qubits that we want to compute on. 
Now, the combination of annihilation and creation operators in this way allows for the tunneling or the hopping of that electron to allow the movement of the electron from the I side to the I plus one side and so forth. I have a little schematic here just to kind of illustrate this. So on the top row here, we have the clock uh, register. So those clock qubits in blue. And on the bottom line here, I have the computational register qubits uh, in red. So what's going to happen is our electrons basically going to hop from each side to the next. For example, in going from the T minus one site to the T site, we'll act with the UT operator on some subset of qubits in our register, in this case, alpha and beta. We'll then continue on with their computation until finally we're going from the K minus one site to the K site, in which we act with UK onto some subset of qubits in our register. I'm going to start with this with a very simple example, which I'm sure you'll all be clear with. But it's going to just involve uh, two qubits in our clock space, so k equals two. So in this case, we add to the n qubits in our register a new set of k plus one qubits, in this case three. Our Hamiltonian will have been given by that equation in three and letting k equals two in our summation, and it's shown here. Our clock space will consist of three states, uh, the zeroth state, the first state, and the second state. So now let's go through how the process will occur. So we're going to start off our system being in sign out, being in the zero state of the clock space, this one here, and with the register having that input state psi in. Now we'll act on this state with the Hamiltonian. The only term that can originally act is going to be this first term here. It's going to annihilate that occupied site in the zero site, and it's going to create an occupied site in the first site. So it's basically converted us from the zero state of the clock space to the first state, as shown here. And in doing so, we also act with U1, onto the input state of a register. So we're now going to be in this state. We're then going to act again with our Hamiltonian onto this state. The first term no longer will act as the first annihilation operator will just convert this to nothing. But instead, we're now going to act with the second term here. The annihilation operator will convert that first site to an unoccupied site, and the creation operator will convert that unoccupied site to an occupied site. So we're now in the final state of our register, the second state of our or of our clock space, sorry. And in doing so, we're going to act with that second operator, the U2, onto our input state of our register. So our computation is now complete, as you can see. We're in the final state of our clock space, and all the operations have acted in succession on our input state, meaning we've arrived at psi out or psi k equals two. So now we can start talking about the core question of this project, which was looking into the efficiency of the model. And this is going to be related to the evolution operator. So when I speak about the efficiency of the model, we basically want to work out the runtime of the model. So how long it would take for a computation. Now, what this is actually going to relate to is just going to be the probability of computation completion. So for example, the probability that having started in the zero state of the, of the clock space and evolving with Feynman's Hamiltonian, that we end up in the Kate state of the clock um, space. Can, can I ask a question? Um, yeah, go for it. I mean, to, to, I mean, in, in a way, this seems like to be like two notions of performance of this. One is the actual probability of success. I mean, that you are basically looking at, and the other one is like the the overall performance of the evolution, like in I don't know, like a trace distance closeness of the actual final state to the anticipated final state, right? But you are focusing on the probability of success. Is that right? Yeah, we're just focusing on the probability of success. What we're basically going to end up deriving is we're going to try and derive an optimal time to start, stop the computer. So we're going to maximize the probability and then work out what the probability of completion is at that optimal time. And then we'll know how often we'll have to run the computer to have a success of unity um, mm -hmm. so that we know if we check that, uh, that clock space, it will be complete. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there are other ways of looking at the efficiency. This is just the one we chose for this particular um, study. Um, so to, I guess, show for a very simple example how you would get out the probability of completion, we'll deal again with k equals two, just to really illustrate this. It is quite a simple example. One of the first things to note is what we're really looking at when we're trying to get a general formula for the probability of completion is we have to look at the Feynman's Hamiltonian a good bit. What the first thing you'll notice is this Hamiltonian will grow in size quite quickly. For k equals two, it's already an eight by eight matrix. So it's gonna be quite hard to notice patterns in this Hamiltonian. So we try and reduce it to a, a smaller form. And we're going to do this by using the fact that the Hamiltonian conserves electron number, or in other words, it conserves the number of sites that are occupied in the clock space. So basically, if we start with a clock space, only one site occupied, only one site will stay occupied for all time. 
So we use a trick that's called block diagonalization of a Hamiltonian. And it basically uses the property that the Hamiltonian can be re-expressed in terms of the basis vectors of our clock space as they are a complete and orthonormal set. So we basically do this for k equals two. And our Hamiltonian takes on this block structure where it's actually composed of four blocks here. I'm now gonna kind of explain what each block is. So the first block here represents a clock space in which no sites are occupied for all time. It's a very boring clock space, nothing will ever happen. In a similar way, the last block here rec represents a block space, uh, clock space in which all sites are occupied for all time. Again, nothing happens. The two in the center here are then more interesting. So the second one is basically the clock space in which one site is occupied for all time. And the second one is a clock space in which two sites are occupied for all time. The second one can basically be seen as the zero tunneling rather than the one. But for the interest of R, um, for Feynman's quantum computer, we're only going to deal with that clock space where one side is occupied for all time and that one electron is tunneling through the different orbitals. So because none of these different blocks interact, they represent different clock spaces, we can extract the only one that we're actually um, interested in. So our Hamiltonian is going to take on this form here. Now we can actually, when we're extending to all k, we can extend the form of this Hamiltonian. So you'll see it takes on this tridiagonal form. And when we extend to all k, it will basically go as u1, u1 dagger, u2, u2 dagger, u3, u2 dagger, u4, u4 dagger, all the way down to uk, uk dagger. So this Hamiltonian generalizes for all k. For k equals two, however, we have a very important, um, the Hamiltonian obeys this very important equation, which is based that we can relate the cube of the Hamiltonian back to the Hamiltonian itself. Now this makes expanding out our Taylor expansion for the matrix of the evolution operator a lot simpler because we can have this kind of recursive relation of relating all the H's back to the Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian squared and then reducing it down to sign and cause terms. And this is better illustrated in a matrix form. So we now have a matrix for our evolution operator for K equals two. Now we're, the, we're only actually interested in one element of this matrix and that's gonna be the zero two element here because that basically represents that fidelity between the zero state and the k state being two here, which is what we need for that probability of completion. And when you actually look at this matrix, that term is the one that we've interested in because we have the u1 and u2 operating in succession, representing that our computation is complete. So now let's compute the probability of completion for this um, particular uh, number of operations. So again, we're looking at this formula here, which I've just explained above is equivalent to the two zero element of that matrix. Getting the norm squared of this is gonna um, give us this term here. Now we wanna find out the maximum probability. So we wanna find out what the optimal time would be that would give us that maximum probability to stop the, the clock space at that time. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, um, you, you also have like your, your system state, right? Now, H is an operator that acts on the system and the clock. Yeah. So if you take the matrix value, what happens to the operators that uh, act on the system? Like they don't get mapped to a number or not. So I didn't hear the, the, I didn't hear the end of that, sorry. Like you, you take the matrix value between only, you, you sandwich between two clock states. Yeah. And then you get a number. But like what happens to the operators that act on the system? Uh, like the, they are not mapped to a number if you only take with respect to the clock, the matrix value. Yeah, so in terms of, I'm not sure if this is going to answer your question, but in terms of getting the probability of completion, we only are really caring with the clock space as we know in going from the zero state to the kate state that the computation will be complete. Um, the unitary operators disappear here. As we're getting the norm squared, it's going to end up with the Hermitian conjugates of these u's that will just um, their u by u dagger is going to be the identity uh, anyway. So you get a number times the identity on the... Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, I see, exactly. I see, okay. okay. Sorry. Um, okay, so the max. this is going to be maximized for when t equals pi over root 2. We don't have any units in our Hamiltonian, so we don't know what this is actually going to be in terms of units. But basically, what we've learned from this is that for two operations, we get a probability of success of unity if we check the program counter at t equals pi over root 2. Meaning that if we check this program counter at this time, we'll have a 100% chance that the clock space will be in that Kate state, that, that second state in this case, and our computation will be complete. Okay, so we can now speak about generalizing the evolution operator for all K. So we we're basically able to work out that that um, evolution operator matrix would hold this form for all K. Now, what's great about this form is that we were able to actually separate, separate out these unitary operators from these coefficients. 
Now, for example, in this uh, smaller case, these would be the, the AIJ of T, and then these are the, the unitary operators that, that go beside them. So we were able to separate this out for all K. And what's great about this is that these um, coefficients here are not dependent on the full Hamiltonian, but are instead dependent on this clock Hamiltonian, which I define here. This clock Hamiltonian is basically just the entire Hamiltonian with those unitary operators removed. So before we would have had a U1, U1 dagger, U2, U2 dagger, we've now removed those operators and they now lie here. And the coefficients are gonna be independent of these. Now, why this is great is that when working out the probability of completion, we discovered above that it's actually related to the K0 element of this um, matrix, which is actually just gonna be the K0 coefficient um, of this formula here which means we can relate the probability of completion to an evolution using the clock Hamiltonian rather than the full Hamiltonian. Now this clock Hamiltonian is very easy to diagnose. It's actually a very well-researched Hamiltonian. It's basically, if you think of it, it's a it's the Hamiltonian for the type binding model with um, even couplings and zero on-site potential. So it's been looked into with great detail. We can very easily work out the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and therefore get out a general formula. Can, can, can I ask you a question? Um, yes. I mean uh, of, of course, this is a triviality for um, a circulate matrix. If it's completely, um, well, if if uh, it's commuting with a full transform, if you want, or if there's a one on the right hand side, because then, I mean, clearly the spectrum is just one plus, it's one sine two pi i over, over two n. Um, but if the corners are missing, this is a tri banded matrix, which is still easy to compute, but it's slightly st less straightforward. Do you mean the the fully circulant one, or do you mean the one where the corners are a little bit wrong? Um, so this right. is the one out the corner, so it doesn't have that um periodic, I guess. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. So after this, we just have that we were relating it now to the clock Hamiltonian. Now, before I get into actually deriving out this full um, I guess form for our probability of completion, I want to take a little slight detour, give you guys a rest from Feynman's quantum computer, and talk a bit about um the adiabatic quantum computer. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because the adiabatic quantum computer has been studied in a lot greater detail than Feynman's quantum computer. And it's actually been studied with regard to evolution using Feynman's clock space. So I'm gonna get into that now. So basically, Ahrenov and his co-workers, it's shown in this paper in the footnote here, what they basically worked on was they were able to show that adiabatic quantum computation is computationally equivalent to the uh, actual quantum circuit model. And what this means is they were able to, given an arbitrary quantum circuit, design an adiabatic quantum computation that would have the same output as the quantum circuit model. So what we basically do is we start with this arbitrary quantum circuit, as we've done before, where we let our input state be that psi in there, acted on the series of k unitary gates, the same as what I've defined before, and we'll get that output state um, being the UK operators acting in succession on psi in. And now what we basically need to do is basically design an adiabatic quantum computation that would have this same output. So as a little summary of what adiabatic quantum computation is, it's basically a framework um, in which we vary this Hamiltonian H of S, which is defined here, and H of S basically, the S is this tunable parameter from zero to one, and it's in terms of two Hamiltonians, the initial Hamiltonian and the final Hamiltonian. And what we basically do is we initialize this Hamiltonian. So we initialize our system to be in the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian at a beginning time. We'll then slowly increase our parameter S with regards to the spectral gap of our Hamiltonian H of S. And by the adiabatic theorem, if this is, um increase slowly, we'll stay in the ground state at each instant of S in that Hamiltonian at that instant for all time until we eventually reach the final Hamiltonian. And we're going to be in the ground state of that final Hamiltonian, which is when S is going to be equal to one here. Now, if we can encode the output of our computation into the ground state of our final Hamiltonian, then a quant an adiabatic quantum computation will have been implemented. Now, a very first natural guess at what, the what these initial and final Hamiltonians should be would be an initial Hamiltonian which has its ground state psi in and a final Hamiltonian which has its ground state psi out. Now immediately we run into difficulties here because we don't know what psi out is. So we don't know what we should have as our final Hamiltonian. Now in order to bypass this issue, Aronov and his co-workers basically use the work of Feynman and Kaitev and basically realize they could bypass this issue by incorporating in Feynman's clock space. So one can verify that this initial Hamiltonian here, 
which as can you can see incorporates in Feynman's clock space in the same way, the same clock space we defined before. This has as its ground state, the required initial um, sign off, which is in the zero state of the clock space and has that input state of a register psi in. Now this final Hamiltonian, which again incorporates that clock space, has the required ground state, which we call psi history here. It's basically a history state, which has a superposition of all the orthonormal states, um, psi t. Where psi t is again being in the t state of the clock space with ut operators acting on psi in. Now, one of the things to remember is that where it's sufficient to have an adiabatic quantum computation where the final Hamiltonian has as its ground state, just a, a non-negligible inner product with our output state, which is exactly what this history state does. If you notice when t equals k here, the output state is going to be being in that final state of the clock space with all operators acting on psi in, meaning we do have a non-negligible inner product with our, our correct output state. So Arhanov then basically was able to replace this clock part by this slowly varying matrix, the clock Hamiltonian. This is in the same way that we just derived a clock Hamiltonian for Feynman's quantum computer, which had that tridiagonal matrix of the ones on the off diagonals. This instead depends on that parameter S, so it's a bit more difficult to diagonalize. But Dooley and co-workers, such as Tony Dorlas and Dias, were able to show that the spectral gap of this Hamiltonian is bounded below by order k to the minus two, where k here is still the number of operators we have to use. Now, by previous work done by Born, the time needed for an adiabatic evolution is proportional to this uh, spectral gap to the power of minus two, which leads to an estimated runtime of order k to the four. And this is the one thing I need you to remember from this little section of the talk is that the adiabatic model has a runtime of order k to the four. This is now what we're going to try to compare the runtime of our model, the Feynman's model, to later on, and we'll be able to see which is a more efficient model. Okay, so now let's get back to Feynman. As I just stated, we now want to look at the probability of completion, which is going to start with having to diagonalize our original clock Hamiltonian. We are able to do this using Fourier transforms quite simply to get out the eigenvalues in this way here with these corresponding eigenvectors. As I mentioned before, we've now related the computation of completion to an evolution, which is the clock Hamiltonian, which we now know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for. So it was very easy to find a resulting expression for the probability of completion for any time t with any number of operations as given here. This is one of the first main results of this project. And one of the great things about this result is that it's an exact expression. No approximations were made in getting to this um, this formula here. So any numerical analysis we, we do on it is an exact result and does reflect uh, directly the, the behavior of Feynman's quantum computer. So let's now look at how this kind of computer will perform. So first of all, I've plotted here the probability of computation completion for a given number of k operators against time. You might immediately be wondering why I chose k equals 9,999 to do this. And um, there's no reason other than the fact that I just prefer odd numbers to even numbers. I think they don't get as much attention. So I wanted to use um, an odd number here. The main thing to note is that no matter what number you use for k here, the same plot will, um, will be given. This isn't dependent on k. The same kind of behavior is always shown irre irrelevant of what k you'd pick. And the main thing to see here is that the first local maximum of the probability of completion is actually the global maximum. So that means that the optimal stopping time will be the time of the first local maximum of the probability of computation completion. There's quite a small window to capture this optimal stopping time, which is a bit of a concern, after which there is these rapid oscillations of decreasing amplitude, at which it's a lot less, um, it's not as good to capture the, the clock at this point. What we wanted to basically do now is find a relationship between these optimal stopping times, which occur at that first maximum, and the number of operations. So here I've basically plotted uh, the relationship between the optimal stopping time and the number of operations. We gladly found a linear relationship between these two, which basically means that if, for example, we have 20,000 operations, the optimal stopping time will be half of that, so around 10,000 units. Now that we've related that optimal stopping time to the number of operations, we can now get out a formula for the probability of computation completion at that op optimal stopping time, just in terms of the number of operations. So we've done that in this next plot here, which is one of the main results uh, from our numerical analysis, is we plotted that maximal probability, that PK of tau, as a function of K. And we found that it actually has an inverse scaling with K. 
So the relationship we found that it had is some coefficient by k to the minus two thirds. What this basically means is to obtain a successive unity, we'd have to repeat the calculation k to the two thirds times. One thing that was really um, really good about this analysis is that the data points really lie directly on our best fit. We went from about a number of operations of about in the hundreds to all the way up to around 50,000 operations. So we see that this is a really good fit for no matter what number of operations you use, both for small operations and very large. We didn't want to, however, solely trust our numerical analysis in case we got out a best fit that wasn't actually a, a direct um, reflection of Feynman's quantum computer. So we decided to do an analytical analysis um, on the probability of completion to try and get out this relationship to K. This was a very mathematically rigorous derivation um, and I won't go into the meat of it. However, the main thing we used is we used that fact that that uh, AK0 tau coefficient is related to the probability of completion. And it's given by this formula here. After a good bit of manipulation, we're basically able to approximate this sum by a Riemannian integral. So we relate AK0 of tau to this form here. And the main thing to note here is that this coefficient is related to K to the minus one third. Now, when we then get the norm squared of it, we find that the probability of computation completion at that optimal time is going to be some coefficient by k to the minus two thirds, which is an exact match to the numerical scaling we found for the probability of completion. So we actually can say with very definite certainty that that is the correct scaling for Feynman's quantum computer. Now, a, comparis a comparison of the efficiency of both models. So just as a reminder, when we looked at the adiabatic quantum computation, uh, as previously stated, it was found the spectral gap was bounded below by order k to the minus two by Dooley and his team. This led to an estimated runtime of order k to the four. Now for the model we're looking at, Feynman's clock model, the computation was complete with probability pk of tau of order k to the minus two thirds in time tau of order k. So as I mentioned, to obtain a success probability of order one, one therefore has to repeat the calculation of order k to the two three times what leads to an estimated runtime of order k to the five thirds when we take into account that um, that tau is linear in k. Now, when we compare the two runtimes of the two models, we actually find that Feynman's clock model has an estimated runtime, which is a significant improvement over adiabatic evolution. Just to show in a graph, this shows Feynman's quantum computer here as order k to the minus two thirds and the adiabatic evolution as well, which is order k to the minus three when you take out that um, order of k for the uh, the time of the optimal stopping time. Um, now we did neglect a number of, there were some concerns. Obviously this is for an ideal machine and we haven't considered how this would be implemented. So we were mainly concerned about that optimal stopping time. That was one of the main considerations that we'd kind of ignored. The fact that there's such a small window to capture that probability would make it a lot harder to implement in practice. So we wanted to kind of analyze a little bit as an as an extra thing, just to see um, how how certain we'd have to be with that optimal stopping time and stopping the program counter. So what we basically wanted to look into was the time difference between the first and second maximum. What this would basically show us is if there's a very small time difference between these two maxima, then it would be very difficult to capture that optimal stopping time before we're already in those rapid oscillations of decreasing amplitude. However, if this time difference is actually quite large and grows with k, then it would be a lot less likely that we could capture um, that cursor at the right point. So we derived the time difference between uh, the two first maxima. We actually were able to do this both numerically and analytically, although the analytical calculation was again very rigorous. And we managed to work out that the time difference between the two was of order k to the one third. So this means that for a large number of operations, this gap also grows so in principle, it is actually possible to stop the calculation close to the optimal time, as long as we're using kind of a large number of K operations. As kind of a further outlook, there were a number of kind of imperfections in the model that we did ignore. Um, for example, with the actual implementation of Feynman's quantum computer, if you look at it as kind of in a similar way, if you remove those operators, it is quite like a type bonding electron model in the program counter or a, a spin chain, I guess. And if those the couplings in that chain weren't exactly equal, then you might not have kind of a ballistic spread out of that wave packet. And instead, it could go back and forth or the cursor could get stuck in a trapping region, uh, which could lead to a, a much less efficient um, runtime. As well as that, there could be even interactions in the register itself. There could be, you know, crosstalk or 
terms in the Hamiltonian we didn't account for, that could be interaction between the clock space or the register. A lot of these things we haven't considered, but they are kind of an outlook for the future for what we could do with Feynman's quantum computer. For now, however, um, I hope you enjoyed that talk. Um, and if you have any other questions, then feel free to ask.